of your life. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to live mine. If there are aspects of it that you can pull from, great. Chew the meat, spit out the bones, right? But I'm going to post range. Right. I, is to be able to be themselves and be loved and accepted for being themselves. That's ultimately what I believe all human beings want. Yeah. yeah. For this person you don't even know that well, only gone on a few dates, you're trying to act a certain way, and all that's where the, the, the inauthenticity starts to creep in. That's what everyone welcome back to the fit and frugal podcast i am your host tani win you can find me on ig at tanasaurus so today i'm super excited we just crossed our 21st episode milestone and with me now i have mike kim hilarious friend i just met through our friend kevin welcome welcome to the casting couch 21 <laughs> that means i'm legal i'm making the show legal yeah. hell yeah all right I'm legalizing be, yeah I'm, I'm i'm honored to be here <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you know, what was really funny is that you were talking about people think that it's all fancy that you're traveling and doing all these gigs that you've been on the road for two weeks now. And Vegas is your what, third stop. And today is your third hotel destination just in Vegas alone. And what was really hilarious is you're like, you know, I was trying to do my laundry and I was walking on the sidewalk. <laughs> I had my bag of laundry. Yeah, I popped the bag. So all of my stuff flew over the sidewalk, probably touched some needles that were on the ground. Um, but I got them into the wash anyway. I travel light. Um, I'm afraid of like, I guess, commitment or something, you know, <laughs> right? Like bringing a lot of luggage or like going through Your therapist baggage. knows about that, right? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought it's a, your travel tendencies say a lot about who you are, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just been on the road a lot. Um, last four weeks I've been on the road for three of them but I don't have anyone to blame it's my fault yeah. but it's also my doing like I love it yeah. I love it so um but yeah you know people see all the highlights on Instagram and like all the stuff on social media and it sounds really cool but you got to do laundry you can't pack two weeks of laundry in like uh in a carry-on so you yeah. got to do it sometime <laughs> right so yeah eventually um, I did talk to one of my friend, Matt. He said he's like he wants to get to a financially secure level to where if he travels, he just hops on a plane. He goes to wherever destination he lands, buys all new stuff and then just leaves and then just donate everything that he bought for himself during that trip. OK, was, that sounds like a good idea, but I hate shopping. Yeah. So I don't want to go Makes shopping sense. when I go somewhere. I can order it and then ship it there. What if it doesn't fit you? Yeah, that's yeah. I got That's why you just you stick know? with the clothes you know. Like yeah. Lululemon, they should endorse <laughs> me. Um, I hope they do. Support the podcast here. Support the podcast. Or yeah. support me, right? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> he's like, yeah. "Fuck Tony, support yeah. <laughs> me." <laughs> yeah, it's light. It's 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 easy to pack. It's light. It's comfortable. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, you find out all these like trade secrets, and you find out a lot about yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like an art, like trying to make a home of where you are. People always say like home is where the heart is, right? Um, I checked recently. I've been a Marriott member for like ten or eleven years. And how many days I've actually stayed in a Marriott hotel on my own account. So this is not counting when other companies or corporations have put me up because they put it on their account. Mm -hmm. It's something like 1,200 days. So I've literally spent like four years of my life in, in Marriott moment. properties. It's like crazy when you think about that. Like four years. Are you I've an affiliate by any chance? Are you getting any brand deals from no, them? No, no. I'm sure there are other people who have spent more like time in those hotels. But yeah. like, I, it's just like I've just stuck with it. And there, it's weird. Like there's a familiarity to it. Yeah. Like I know which brands are what within the Marriott chain. Yeah. And I kind of know what's going to look like. And it sort of feels oddly comfortable. That's what they said about the Starbucks design too. They said that they yeah. want every Starbucks to kind of feel familiar so that when you enter the space, the colors, the warmth, the texture, the wood, it makes you feel like you're at any other Starbucks mm -hmm. so that you're not thrown off because mm -hmm. they want people to feel just at home. And I really like that fact that you kind of take away the glamorized aspect of traveling and being, you know, the jet set life. And you're like, man, like this happened to me. And it's just so humanizing that, you know, most people, they're like, oh, this guy is so cool. He's traveling. He's speaking. He's in this city one day. He's in this city one day. And here you are. You're like, I don't even have clean underwear and yeah. I got to like, do my laundry. Yeah, it makes me wonder, like, what, am I running from something? But uh, no, I have yeah. a dog. I have a home, you yeah. know, like I, I've settled down, you know, but I love it. Um, yeah. To me, it's like about tapping into the ever evolving narrative of mm -hmm. life. Like I like kind of not knowing who I'm going to meet, mm -hmm. where I'm going to be, what I'm going to eat, where I'm going to, you know, go and what what's going to happen. Um, I'm sort of the, of the mindset like you can't take anything with you when you die, 
right? And so all you go with are your memories and the things that you've made, you know, and created and the experiences that you've had during life. Money's important to allow you to do certain, you know, some of those things. But I would say like life's short, but it's the longest thing you ever do. So like really make the most of it. And um, I've never regretted having those experiences. Some have been crazy, others have been great, right? Like others have been whatever, right? Yeah, you, ha you have those in betweens, but like, well, I, I just th feel like when I'm like 90 years old, I'm not gonna look back and be like, I'm really glad I didn't go take that trip. Mm. I'm really glad I stayed home and didn't go do that thing. Yeah. You know, so that's just kind of how I, I live right now. Yeah, and I'm hearing that it's such a paradox that we live in nowadays is that the more disciplined you say you are to something, like we were talking about having a routine and having structure and having a life of design around the things that you care about, like working out and all that stuff. And we just talked about how when we get busy, for me, like the first thing that goes is my social media. And then pretty much it feels like the end of the world, but it's really not because the more present I am connected to my life, I kind of feel like I forget about my phone and things actually exist that I'm supposed to be doing to build. And it's so funny that you say that because you know, when you say lifestyle by design, you're like, maybe I'm running away from something. But that's another thing that people don't really take a look at is that what is it that actually brings you joy? You know, is it the slow moments that you slow down and you really get to reflect and be really grateful for where you are in life? Because if you're building, the irony is you got to do the boring things to get to a level of success that allows you the freedom to do all these other things. Or is it the other way around to where you have to sacrifice all of your time and all of your freedom in terms of your freedom, your rituals, your routines, so that you can get all these opportunities and be in the world of abundance? Like, how do you feel about those two paradoxes? The way I look at it is that life is not about balance. I don't think there's such a thing as life balancing itself out. I think life is more like harmony. So if you go to a symphony, you hear an orchestra play, it's like the appropriate amount of attention to the appropriate thing for the appropriate amount of time. So you go and hear a piece and it's like, oh, okay, this is the part where the violins are like soloing. So it's the appropriate thing, the violins, the appropriate attention, but they don't blast like the whole concert. They go in and out and then it's like the trumpets and then it's like, you know, whatever, other, the clarinets and whatever, right? And so life's kind of like that. I don't think it's like perfectly eight hours you sleep, eight hours you work, eight hours you have leadership time. It doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. right? It's And seasons of life don't work that way. So there were seasons where I had to slow down because I had other responsibilities and other commitments that I made. And then when I had more time on my hands, I was like, okay, I'm the only person I have to really worry about. So I can go out there and do these things, right? And do, do what I want. Um, but I'm looking forward to Sunday when I have like the day off and like gonna kind of crash, right? But it's the appropriate amount of attention to the appropriate thing for the appropriate amount of time. That's always helped me. In my line of work, I run a marketing agency, I'm a speaker, I coach, and I do a lot of stuff in the business space. And typically the events in our industry are like in the spring and the fall. So I know it's gonna get busy with travel. If I say yes to a bunch of events, it's gonna get busy around then. People, no surprise, they don't do events in the summer because they all want to go on vacation. In winter, they're all like, it's too cold. No one wants to travel. <laughs> so yeah. like spring and the fall, I, I typically know it's going to be pretty busy with travel. And, and that's cool. I just plan around it, right? I just plan around it. Yeah, I'm still processing that because I love the way you articulate that it's an integration between work and life because everyone does say that, right? But I feel like the more people I talk to that are really into their craft, for us is an obsession because they're like, damn, you're at the podcast studio. I'm like, yeah, like this is the thing that I love to do. Is it I'm running away from my responsibilities? No, I don't know, ask my dog. Maybe I'm abandoning her <laughs> just a little bit, but I'm not there yet to like <laughs> bring my dog with me, you know? So that's a, that's a funny thing, right? Cause you said you have a dog. And yeah, so it's like, okay, so I got this dog about a year and a half ago and I totally bought her on a whim. I used to have two small dogs, so it's not like she was my first. Uh, and I was walking through the shopping mall with a friend of mine, um, and we just randomly had to go to the mall. He was like, hey, another buddy of mine has to return some clothes. Just Let's just hang out and walk around, kill some time. So I walked by the pet store at the mall, and I know you're not supposed to get pets from the store. Okay, you're supposed to adopt. But I saw her, and I was like, oh, I, I miss dogs, like because my ex-wife has my dogs. And so I went in, played with her, and she was like all up on me, and she was so cute. I was like, oh my gosh, this is meant to be, <laughs> right? 
So I'm like, maybe I should get her right now. And my friend was like, maybe you should sleep on it. Right? I was like, okay, all right. And I slept on it. And then the next morning, I like heard her running around my apartment. I could just hear her like, you know, paws on the floor. So I go back and buy her. I, I get her without thinking about it. She's all up on me again. I'm like, oh, this is meant to be. My friends come over that afternoon. She does the same thing to all of them. I was like, damn, I was not special. <laughs> she played me, man. Like she she just like played me. <laughs> she 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 got the bag, right? Yeah. Like she like got a home, right? Yeah. And so um she's like, I don't care. I just yeah. need to get the hell out of yeah, here. Yeah, she's like one of those, man. It's it's like surprising. But she's brought so much um joy into my life and like some groundedness. But I found some amazing sitters. The lady has three young daughters, and they love her. She loves them. And they live like five minutes away from my house. And they're always available because three young kids, they're not going anywhere, right? Yeah. Like they've got school and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I feel like sometimes I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm just like ditching her. But she doesn't think twice about it, I think. <laughs> She's yeah. like happy. She's like, they feed me better, and they play with me more. So it's like, yeah. it's fine, right? It's but it's a just a kids touching me at the, at the mall, you yeah. know? Yeah, it's so it's cool. You know, it's cool. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, that's funny because when I got my dog and then it became COVID, so I was like joking. I was like, damn, like that dog taught me more personal responsibility than I've ever had even for myself. Mm -hmm. Like I actually feed it well, like it's on time. Like that was the actual first routine thing that I've developed over this course of like the last three years. I was like, how irresponsible am I that I don't even know when I'm going to eat? I was like, maybe I should follow this design that I designed for my dog to have a routine of when she wakes up, which is 5 a.m. Oh, man. Lunch. Yeah, she's a freaking morning dog. Like, ever since I've gotten her, like, it's like 4 or 5 o'clock, she's, like, in my face. Like, and I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Like, when we, you know, how we touch on, like, spirituality and all of these aspects of what makes a successful life that people don't see on social media. Because there's a lot of things that I feel like we do that we – are hesitant about posting either you think that you should post something or you want to post something it kind of comes from that to pull within you that's like ah oh, maybe this is like no one's gonna care or this is a little bit too much information but i find it really funny you know <laughs> so as a marketer like ever since we've shared those stories of you tapping into unblocking yourself from a lot of your limiting beliefs and all that stuff like where do you feel that has led you in your marketing like creative side yeah like one of the things i always say to people is that like if you're thinking about what to post what to share because a lot of people do wonder about that like should i post this or should i post that um first if you just want to express yourself you can just post whatever you want that's fine right if, if it's just a vehicle of self-expression like it's fine um but on the other side of it if you're concerned about building a brand or building your business or whatever whatever right i just tell people um ask yourself can you build a campfire around what you're sharing and what I mean by that, is it warm? Is it inviting? What happens at campfires? Like, it's a light in a dark place. Like, people feel like it's, it's like, warm and welcoming, right? Uh, it's inclusive. Um, it's other people sharing their stories, not just one person, right? Because too many people build a brand or they think about social media in one of two ways, and neither of them really work well, right? Mm -hmm. On one hand, you see people trying to sell a version of themselves that is not true, They'll rent a mansion on Airbnb, take a bunch of photos, and they're sort of like implying that that's their house, right? Mm -hmm. It's like so tacky, right? But yeah. people do that. And then the pendulum swings the other way, and then people feel like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to be completely authentic and just be me all the time, right? But they're not really coming from a place of like wholeness or mm -hmm. healing. And yeah, they're getting attention, but so does the car accident on the freeway when everyone slows down and has to look at what's causing all the traffic, yeah, there's a lot of eyeballs, but they don't stick around. They don't stay. And those people end up trying to sell their struggles instead of, like, a solution, right? And mm -hmm. they're just airing all their dirty laundry. So I just tell people, like, just ask yourself, can you build a campfire around what you're sharing? It doesn't always have to be some sort of content that you're trying to teach or, like, add value or whatever. Sometimes the best content and the best performing content I teach or, or post it's just stuff about my family, my dog, mm. like my mom. Like when I my book came out, like I shot a video. She hates being on video. She's an Asian mom. Like yeah. she don't want to be on video. And um, that was one of those things where I'm like, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Mm. So I walked out, had my phone on, and I handed her. I was like, Mom, I uh, my book came in here. And she's just like, oh, and she's just like laughing. And 
what person could not identify with like a parent being proud of their kid for doing something? Yeah. And then she said a bunch of stuff that uh, was actually kind of funny. She was like, oh, you were really bad in school. I didn't think you had that much talent. <laughs> I was like, thanks, I guess. She's like, but you worked really hard and I guess it worked out. I was like, oh, it's such an Asian mom thing to say. Yeah. Right. But we have a great relationship. But it like so many people engaged with that post and it was, yeah, it promoted my book in a way, but not directly. Yeah. Because people could understand and like identify and, and like connect with that. So that's just what I tell people. Like, can you build a campfire around it? And then yeah. you're fine. I love that lens on it because when you bring up authenticity and people just sharing a lot of their problems, right? Because I feel like the world, it's so separated in terms of when people post the things that they think it's vulnerable. They're asking for pretty much attention. It's attention seeking. They're like, hey, I'm going through all of these things. And other people feel like they should judge them. Be like, oh, this person's like throwing away their whole life. They're sharing way too much. But it's I think it's they also lack that. Like, I think in a way they kind of envy that the person has the courage to even share with a bunch of strangers, no matter how many followers you think you have. You know, I don't care if you have a thousand followers, 10,000 followers, 100,000, you know. And it kind of comes down to like, what do you think it makes a person authentic when you hear someone's voice like on social media versus in real life? Like what makes an authentic person? I think as long as they're honest about their feelings, I think that's not about their opinions or, or whatnot. Like um, I think when you start, it's just like any relation. I always tell people like marketing isn't about closing a sale. It's about like opening a relationship. That's all it is, right? That's all marketing is. So no relationship ever in your life can really thrive if you're hiding parts of yourself from that person, whether it's a romantic relationship, friendships, or whatnot, anything, right? Like if you're always hiding a part of yourself, that's where the, the, the inauthenticity starts to creep in. That's when like performing and that's like pretending like you're not who you are starts to creep in. Now, yeah, there is a part where if you're on social media and creating content, it's easy for other people to shoot you down and for public opinion to go a certain way. So, yeah, I get that piece, right? But when when I look at somebody, I'm not really asking are they being fake or authentic or not. I'm looking for range. Are they able to comfortably share a range of emotions? or a range of feelings, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that they're always happy and positive. Can they share sometimes when they're frustrated or maybe when they're really ticked off, but they're not sharing from an open wound, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my best content over the last five years was when I opened up a little bit about some personal stuff that I went through, I went through a divorce a couple years ago, five years ago, but I didn't share it while I was going through it. After? Yeah, I did like two, three years after. Mm. And I was like, I'm finally ready to talk about this now. And I wrote a piece on my site in a way that my ex could read it and not feel bad. Like mm. that was my filter. Cause like, what am I going to do? Just like, you know, like I could say something bad about her, but she's going to come right back and say, she could say a ton of bad stuff about me. Right. Yeah. There's never one, no one's ever totally right mm. in that scenario. Right. So I'm like, how do I share a lot of this stuff from a place of, hey, I've got a scar, but it's not an open wound. And mm. I think what I see a lot of people do is they share from like open wounds or this, this hurt me. And like, I see a lot of people who are experts in my industry do this. Like they will screenshot hate mail that they get from people like emails or social media comments. I'm like, that just makes you look super insecure. Yeah, everyone knows people can be stupid online. Mm -hmm. We don't need to read your stuff about how people are saying stupid stuff to you. Like that doesn't add any value yeah. to me, to me, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm always just trying to look for like range, like in, in, in what they're sharing. If they say that they are like, a, I'm going to teach you how to live a great life. All right, great. If people want to learn how to live a great life from somebody else, fine. I tell my people, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to live mine. If there are aspects of it that you can pull from, great. Chew the meat, spit out the bones, right? But I'm going to post range. I, I'm looking for range. And I think that's what people want. It's not a real relationship. Like social media is weird. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a parasocial relationship. 
It's mm. not completely the same thing as, I'll pose you a question. I, I ran this by a bunch of people. If, if you have never <clears throat> met a person mm. face to face and you only talked on Zoom, have you actually met? Oh, uh, okay. You've yeah. only met somebody on Zoom. Have you actually met? That's true. I had this exact thought when I had to teach um, students through Zoom. And it was so disengaging that we're all freaking out. It was COVID. And this exact prompt kind of came up. It's like, do we actually know each other? Because we don't have the face-to-face interaction. But in the Zoom, we're like, well, we're face-to-face. But we don't have each other's energy. Yeah. There's actually no exchange. Like, yeah. you actually can't feel how they feel or you can't feel just in their space like it's really hard um if you've only met on zoom have you ever really met yeah okay i i see where the question's yeah, going i don't think so i think on the superficial no. layers yes you oh. know of the person but i would never introduce like hey this is my friend that i know from zoom yeah yeah it's so weird right mm-hmm. so yeah. now we're dealing with this whole other like level of human inter- interaction where it feels real but it's not mm-hmm and then you have the, where everyone has a platform if their accounts are public and everyone has a platform and you're dealing with this whole other level of expectations from people you don't even know. Yo, I posted this thing on Facebook, which is, I hate Facebook. I just admit it. I hate it, but it's a necessary evil, right? And I, don't, I, I think I posted a picture of myself wearing a suit because yeah, I was at an event. I was I, mm-hmm. I, wore, I never wear suits, right? So everyone gets surprised when I wear suits. And I had to dress up, and these people are like, "Looking good, my friend." I'm, I'm not your. I don't even know your name. <laughs> Who are you, Bob? Like serious? No, seriously. I was like, <laughs> this is so odd. And if yeah. I posted something that they disagreed with, mm-hmm. they would have been like, "You're blah 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 blah," and they would have felt a genuine betrayal. Yeah. And I'm like, who are you? I literally don't know who you are. And it's like, I'm not saying that I'm better than them. I'm just saying this human, there's a level of interaction now that we've never had to deal with before as human beings. Yeah. Like this parasocial relationship. I really like that word because I've talked to some people online through DMs and we'll meet at a real estate event. They're like, oh, it's so good to finally meet you in person. Oh, like you are just as funny as your reels. I'm like. Okay. <laughs> you know what I get? You're way taller than I. I said, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, of course. What would you? What am I going to do? Stand up on Zoom? Yeah. Like for a height reference, right? You only see me from here. I'm six three. Like, yeah. yeah. So I yeah. I think it's an Asian thing too. They just assume Asians to be shorter. Maybe. Especially Asian males are not past like I think six two is probably the highest, right? It's like that's the epitome of Asian male height. But <laughs> it's I don't know. I think it's just funny that. We do have a layer of superficiality, but we have to kind of break through all of that for creative expression. And when you actually show yourself and people will actually see you, which part of you are they seeing? And that thing kind of still shocks me because I was talking to Sean right about this is how I've been living my life is I know I have to be on social media and I've been talking to some old friends, right? They're like, oh, like you seem so happy. Like, how much energy does it take to always be on? I'm like, honestly, that's why I get off social media when my energy needs me to be present in real life. It's because I can't be on all the time. And people that are positive all the time, it's fake. And they're probably miserable. It's because toxic positivity is it's one of those things that I really hate and kind of mainstream, like spirituality kind of came out with that. Like, oh, you know, good vibes only, da, da, da. I'm like, no, like, show me. Like, you said the range of emotions. Like, no, show me your dirt. Show me your baggage. If I'm truly your friend, I can sit here with you and go through stuff with you. That's what a true friend is. But if you hit even a little bit of struggle and you can't really connect with someone, that's the disconnection that I feel like it's heavily dominated now in social media is that everyone is forced to be happy all the time and post all of their wins. But if someone posts is like, oh, this happened to me today, you know, I don't know, I lost a, a sale or something. And people are like, oh, this person's always complaining about their problem. I'm like, right. And it's so hard for us to even find that synergy in between, like, then what the hell do you want me to be, you know? Yeah. And it's really hard to be yourself. And it's like, how would you live your life if social media didn't exist? Like, would that change your business? It wouldn't change my business too much. Um, I actually kind of went through this because I was like, oh, I'm just so, I don't love doing social media. I, I honestly don't. Um, I view it like, <laughs> might not be a great example, but like 
what's a good guiding principle for the world's best drug dealers? <laughs> you don't get high on your own supply, mm. right? So here I am, I have this business and people see all this stuff on social media. I don't read my own headlines. I don't read my own press. Like I know that that is not reality at all. So there were times during COVID, no one could travel. I just abandoned my Instagram account and and Facebook and all that. I was like, whatever, like, what am I supposed to post? We're all locked up at home, right? Yeah. It didn't hurt my business. I built my business different ways, like through email lists. I had a podcast and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but like, I actually feel social media does not represent how good my life is. Mm. And it's not good because I'm having all these experiences and traveling. Like, that's a huge part of it. But I actually like my life. I really enjoy my life. It doesn't mean that it's all easy. I think that's what people get screwed up in their minds. Like, easy means it's good. It's not. I don't want anything easy. You don't want no. anything easy. Like, we're, we talked a little bit about this, mm -hmm. like, on my show. Like, um, we're pretty intense people. Like, we, we like to work hard. We like to feel like we're at our edge and, like, using the highest capabilities that we have. And yet, like, the, the, the real work is just learning to really love yourself and, being, and accept yourself. And how are you supposed to show that on social media? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Did like, you have the same level of self-love as you do now? And let's just say, like, from Mike Kim 10 years ago when you were beginning your career, as you would call it, right? Like, do you envision this level of happiness and success that you feel in your present day and how that looks like what you wanted your life to look like 10 years ago? I think 10 years ago, I was in a present negative trying to go to a future positive. That's how I looked at it. Okay. I want to get out of my day job. I want to I want to just do something that fulfills me and so on and so forth. But what, that's a very blanket statement though, because you have a present negative, but you also have a present positive. Your life. Not everything life in life is 100% bad, usually, right? Like there are some people who are in very exten extenuating circumstances where yes, it's all really bad, right? They got to get out. But I was living in Jersey. I had a good job, six figure job, right? Like, yeah, I could complain about certain things, but I, I could view it like I'm in a, um, a present negative and trying to go to a future positive. But there's also future negative. When I became my own boss and started my business, I was like, man, there's a lot more responsibilities than I thought. <laughs> I joke with people, I'm the worst boss I've ever had. Why? I make myself work all the time. I don't give myself time <laughs> off. Like I'm like the worst boss I've ever had. Is right? that the I'm, biggest challenge you had to overcome is yourself to become your own boss? Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in some ways, yeah, mm -hmm. right? In some ways, yes. I loved it, but if I, I would never treat my friends or an employee or a contractor the way I treated myself yeah. and the expectations that I had, but I could always justify it. Like, this is what it takes to get the business off the ground. I have to say yes to this. I have to say yes to that. I have to go there. I have to go here. So it's never a complete picture. And I think what we tend to do is like we see these people on social media and we think that that's their whole life or we think what we're putting there is our whole life and that that's what people want from us. If you know, I've worked with very, very well-known people and it's, it's lonely, it's difficult, right? They don't feel like people really understand them or they have to put on a performance and yes, they do. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, they do. People don't want to necessarily understand or get to know the totality of who their heroes are. It's more convenient to say, this is my favorite basketball player, this is my favorite politician, this is my favorite online guru. I need that, don't give me anything else. And then when you do something that's a little bit outside of what's expected, they feel like it's off brand or that they betrayed them or something, right? Like yeah. stick to your lane, stay in your lane. Yeah. And they say stuff like that. And what everybody really wants at the end of the day is to be able to be themselves and be loved and accepted for being themselves. That's ultimately what I believe mm -hmm. all human beings want. Yeah. Why do you think it's so hard for people to actually put down the performative mask and actually go for fulfillment? And what are the limiting beliefs that you feel it's always holding people back? It's the figure, six-figure job, 
it's the relationship they're supposed to be in or what are, what are those factors? I think you named a few and where do those all come from? It's like what society has conditioned us to believe, right? And also let's be real, it's about how society operates. It operates, it's able to continue functioning because of those beliefs or or that message, right? It's Look, I can go on and, and say like, hey, you know, you deserve to have full agency over your life and do whatever you want and follow your passions and, and make a great living doing it. But I'm going to be honest, I'm really glad that people work at Amazon or there are people mm -hmm. who collect the trash in our city. Like, I don't, I don't think if you ask them, is this like how you envision your life? They would say, yeah, I don't think that they would say yes, but we all need all of that for society to be like to function, yeah. right? I, I, in the beginning, I used to feel really weird about this because like, I'd be like, oh, like I literally coach people how to leave their day job and become their own boss. And yet I have people working for me. Yeah. <laughs> like that's a little bit of paradox, right? Yeah. And I remember like hiring um, Chelsea, who's now worked with me for seven or eight years. And I, was, I asked her, what do you envision your life being? Like, what do you want to do with your life? And she's like, I want to, you know, be a lifestyle entrepreneur and be my own boss. And I said, awesome. Let's get that out of the way. At least I know. The day that I stand in the way of that, the day that you working for me stands in the way of that is the day you should leave. Like, leave me. Let me figure things out on my own. Mm. Like, you should, I will bless you. I will, like, be your biggest supporter. Mm -hmm. And she's done that, and she still continues to work with me because I think I had that mentality, right? Yeah. But we need all, like, society works because of some of these things that yeah. you said, right? So we got we to gotta be honest about that. Um, but I think for the few who want to leave that behind, it's tough. It's tough to unlearn. Yeah, because there's a lot of terms, you know, like the rat race, the matrix, and all of these things that make it sound really bad. But I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who are like, you know, sometimes I wish I went back and got a W-2 because there's more control or I feel like there's more of illusion of control in my life than entrepreneurship has given me. Like, it's like a freaking roller coaster, you know, I know. And some months you're like crying by yourself and people don't know you know, anything behind what it is that we actually have to face and all the fears and stuff. How do you think that has shaped you from the minute you became your own boss to like the Mike Kim that's sitting right in front of me, right? <laughs> On this casting couch and like the lessons that you wish you would have known before you made that decision? I think if I were to tell the guy who started that these struggles would be there, he wouldn't have believed me anyway. Really? So I'm just like, when you start, like, you're kind of, you have blinders on. And sometimes that's good. Like, you just do what you're supposed to do. It's more actually in the last two years where I've really felt like, gosh, this is hard. Like, I finally started mm -hmm. to admit this is pretty hard. Like, oh, I chose a much harder route. And I would look at things that I did four, five, six, seven years ago and be like, I can't believe I did that. Dude, this, this was a badass. Like, Lewis fucker. Like, he just yeah. didn't care. Like, and now I'm like, I don't know if it's because I'm getting older, like, slowing down, whatever it is. I don't know. But now I'm, okay, or maybe I'm just getting healthier mm -hmm. and admitting, like, dang, I worked pretty hard. Or I did some pretty incredible things. I'm finally able to give myself credit for it. Yeah, like, you wrote a book. Did you ever see, was that on your vision board, let's just say, when you first began? Like, I'm going to write a book one day and I'm going to speak on stage one day? I didn't have like a one day. Uh -huh. I was more like, I know I'm capable of doing that and I will not like myself if I don't do it. I will mm. not like myself and be content with myself because I know I didn't leave it on the field. And uh, I just made my life so busy that I couldn't settle down enough to pay attention to some of those things. So when actually COVID happened and we all got locked down, that's when I wrote my book. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the bar. Yeah, I wrote the majority <laughs> of my book in a bar. Um, that a lady I had gotten to know ran uh, in Virginia. And the content of my book was all stuff that I knew worked because I would coached on it for like five years. 
I taught it. I had done keynotes on it, the world locked down. So I knew that the content was good and that it helped people really move forward. I just had to do the work and get yeah. it done. And <laughs> like, this is so bad, but you know, you find your own way to motivate yourself. There was a guy I knew, we weren't super tight, but he wrote a book and it was not good. It was not a good book. And he got a publishing deal and everything. And I took the book and I, I put a big, in big black marker, if this guy can do it, you can. I put it in front of my TV. Oh my God. I put it in front of my TV so I wouldn't watch TV. Yeah. And I would just like look at that every morning and be like, I better get to work. Um, butt in seat time, right? Yeah. Like ass to the chair time. You just got to put in the work. And I, had to, I learned a lot about myself. I had to mix up the environment. That's why I went out, you know, to the bar. Like I, you know, it's wild. I couldn't work on it on my laptop. My laptop mm. reminded me too much of work, like too many Zoom calls, like so much of that. It was just like, so I had to change up the modality. Yeah. And separate your environment from your normal mm -hmm. conditions environment. So it was on my phone and at this lady's bar. While they were making takeout, that's how they kept the bar afloat, mm -hmm. like hustle, right? Hustle, yeah. hustling to keep the doors open because um, they couldn't have patrons come in. They would just do takeout and they would send it out. And she's like, yeah, you could just come by. Like we have our staff here, just hang out at the bar. You can just chill out. And yeah. I supported, of course, I didn't drink her alcohol for free. I was just like, hey, he's a couple hundred bucks, whatever. Like help you keep the doors open, help you keep the lights on. And yeah. you're just there for other people, right? So I, the, I have a ton of respect for entrepreneurs, business owners, because that's a level of hustle that most people don't understand. Yeah, it's just to keep your business open, being there 12 hours a day, 14, 16 hours a day. And you know, I have a high level respect for the psychology that you use on yourself, because you're like, if this guy could do it, like you can do it. I never thought of it that way. It's, just, uh, it's always like use your pain and turn it into your power or something. Right? <laughs> if you read something so shitty and it's just like, this guy's way less credible than me. Like there's fucking like <laughs> grammar issues in there. This is not even a sentence. And sometimes you're like, what the fuck? If this fucking person can do it, you know? Yeah, I'm kind of driven by that in a weird way. Like some, I, I guess, you know, like in certain instance, instances, I want to be challenged. Like most people don't challenge me. Like they're, they're, they're like, oh, you know, hey, you're good at what you do. And I'm like, I told my trainer, uh, my physical trainer, he's a nice guy. I said, um, I don't want to know what we're working on. I don't want to know what body part, you know, they usually split it like, you know, chest and back and legs, today's leg. I don't even want to know what day it is. I don't want to know what moves we're doing. I don't want to know how many sets. I don't want to know how many reps and I don't want to know the weight. Just mm. make me do it. And I just turn my brain off. Like there's a piece to that. And I'm like, you can yell at me. Like you can push me harder than you think because I can take it. Yeah. Right. And there's a, a piece of that that I didn't know that really motivates me. Like some might say like it's that's toxic or whatever. It just works for me. Like, yeah. Once in a while, I watch David Goggins videos. I'm like, this is great. Yeah. It's like the fear of the unknown is not even a fear to you. You actually like diving into the unknown. Mm -hmm. And you sound like a masochist because the last couple <laughs> times <laughs> we were talking, you're like, I like really intense shit. I need chaotic environments because I need to thrive. <laughs> I'm learning to make peace with peace, right? And like peace with boredom because that's definitely a thing. Like you start yeah. like wondering like in... I can, I think I can take a lot of intensity, but then I'm just like, why is my life always like this? Yeah. I like to solve too many problems. Like what, what did I have this hero complex or something? Right. Yeah. Um, and you realize like that's where the work like really yeah. takes you, right? You got to focus on that. So, yeah. How do you feel that element of your personality affects your relationship with women since your divorce? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So there's... That's a good conversation. All right, <laughs> let me let me figure out where I want to start with all this. Like, um, Lana's all excited. <laughs> She's like, yeah. yeah. I feel like when, like, I didn't date a lot before I got married because we met at church, and so this was like the second relationship that I'd actually ever been in, and I married her. So when I got divorced, 
it was like dating for the first time, really. But now you're old enough and you have a little bit of money. So you're not bound by the same restrictions that you were when you were like 16, right? Or Trying like, to take someone to Jack in a Box? Yeah, like, let's go to the mall, right? Like, <laughs> I'll pick you up on my bike or something, right? <laughs> so um, it, was, it was a really, like, eye-opening experience. And one of, the, one of the best pieces of advice I got, I did not see this coming. He was a pastor that I knew from, like, 13 years old. And he goes, go on a lot of dates, I'm like, what? You of all people is telling me? He's like, yeah, go on a lot of dates. Otherwise, you'll just pick ex-wife version 2.0. Mm. I thought that was really good advice because I definitely could see that I was looking for her in other people that I met. And I was comparing the people I met to her because I really did love her. Yeah. And um, I probably took it to the extreme. He was probably meant like on like 10 dates. I went on like 100. Right? <laughs> 10x. Like, yeah, 10x it, that, 10X it right? Uh, I don't do anything halfway, right? Like all the way, like right? I became a man whore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I went through that phase for sure, right? And um, I think that part of it was trying, because I felt like really rejected and I felt like very like, you know, like, I told her once, like, you know, no one ever made me feel ugly, like the way that you did. Like you just, I just felt Mm -hmm. like this old pair of jeans that you didn't wear anymore, but you didn't want anymore either. Like Mm. you also didn't want to throw away is what I'm saying. Like you didn't want me anymore, but you also didn't want to let me go. So that was really tough to navigate. So when I went out and, you know, started going on dates and stuff like that, I was pretty, I was very upfront. I'm like, I'm going through a divorce or I'm not divorced yet. Like, it's going to happen. We're just waiting for the court. But all the papers are signed and everything. And um, it was, like, definitely a season of, like, finding myself in a way that I didn't, like, have the opportunity to do before. Yeah. Right? So I noticed, like, the kind of people I was attracted to, the people that were attracted to me, um, how the world really worked in a lot of ways I didn't ever experience, right? So to experience that in my like late 30s, early 40s, for the first time in life, I felt like this is interesting. Like this is kind of overwhelming. Like it was a lot. Yeah. But I don't look back and say I wish I didn't do those things or I'm ashamed of who that guy was or like, you know, because I always felt like I was upfront and honest. And I like that about how I conducted those years. So yeah. it, was, it was a big learning experience. Um, I also found that a lot of people wanted to change me. And that for the people that I really liked, the, girl, the, the girls that I liked, I found that I was willing to change a lot of myself for them, right? And then that's, mm. those are the patterns that I started to notice. Like, why are you compromising who you really are yeah. For this person you don't even know that well, only gone on a few dates, and trying to act a certain way and all that stuff, right? It was just very interesting for me to see those patterns. And I never would have seen them and learned them about myself had I not gone through that. Yeah. So a couple things I picked up is that you were looking for a pattern of your ex-wife in your dating right scene. Did you find a lot of versions of yourself that you were trying to heal at the time too? Because you said like she made you pretty much stop feeling seen and wanted and loved, which is the core needs of who we are as human beings. Yeah, you know? there, there was a tremendous sense of pain around that, like for sure. Um, pain around her, her mom mm-hmm. too. Like we were, I always thought we had a great relationship. And it wasn't like I was married for like a year. Yeah. It was like 10 years when all that stuff happened. And um, I don't think I ever shared this publicly. A lot of my friends know about it in private. But um, they were Korean, so her parents lived in Korea. And when all this stuff happened, I didn't do any of it. Like, I, I wasn't the cause of it, is what I'm saying. Like, I didn't, mm. I don't want to say anything about my ex or whatever, but like, I didn't had I cheated or done something wrong, like I could understand, Yeah. right? So her mom came and um, like saw her one morning, like 
we had separated for a few weeks. So I came back to the house and I woke up in the morning and her mom was there at the house. I walked downstairs and I like, you know, greet her. And she's like, don't call me your mother-in-law. I was like, what? Like, don't mm-hmm. address me as your mother-in-law. Let's just get this over with as quick as possible. I was like, I didn't, I didn't do this. Your daughter did this. Mm-hmm. And that was really, that was really hard. Yeah. Like really painful. And I didn't realize it until someone asked me, like, where's the wound hurt the most? And I was surprised how much that hurt. It yeah. wasn't like from my ex. Mm-hmm. It was from her mom. And so, like, we had been separated for a little while, and, like, all our pictures were taken off the wall. And all of my clothes were taken from the master bedroom and thrown into the guest room. That's, like, the first time I had stayed in my house, like, three, four weeks. Yeah. And so that level of like, we're just gonna cut you off. Again, if I had done something, mm-hmm. I could understand that kind of Vitality rejection. Or, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it's just so brutal, right? Yeah. So, um, can can I ask a question? Yeah, what did she tell them for them to be treating you like that if you didn't do shit? I don't know. She told them something. Yeah, I, I don't know till this day, and I'm okay with not knowing. Right, like I'm like this is as far as it's gonna go. I'm never gonna get certain answers. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need to know. It's fine. Do you feel like you have closure? Yeah, one thousand percent. Yeah, like you closed a wound, as yeah. you said, like it's a scar now, and you're happy. Yeah, moving on and sharing. Yeah, that she's journey. gotten remarried. I'm yeah. super happy for her. Yeah, I wish him the best, you know, but I don't. I honestly don't know. Yeah, you're actually you a know, really so. positive ex because there's a lot of exes I've met that are really bitter and resentful towards their ex and they don't like their ex just as much. And I'm mm-hmm. like, why can't you just be happy for this person? I found myself in those conversations. And I'm like, wow, these are really bitter human beings that I I hope I take that as a, a motto of how I don't want to turn out to be. Yeah. If any of my relationship yeah. felt like I still want to be happy for another human being just because they deserve to be happy. Just not with me. You know, mm-hmm. obviously it's a misalignment. <laughs> yeah. Start fresh, rip the bandaid, move on. But yeah. And maybe yeah. it was, you know, partially because when we got married, we were young, you know, we were in our twenties and I was older than her. And that's all, the age difference is a lot more when you're in your twenties than, you know, later on in life. Mm-hmm. That's another thing I realized, right? Like, so we were seven years apart When you're in your twenties. That, that's a, that's a big gap. Mm. Like on the lower end of the sp- younger end of the spectrum, you're just kind of graduating college. Yeah. Right. And on the other end of the spectrum, you're just starting to really find your footing and what you're going to do with work and your life and stuff like that. Now, you know, I meet somebody who's seven, eight, ten years younger. Like it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Right. Different, different age and stage in life. Yeah. Um, but I, I cared and loved her like I really did. And that's why I took it so hard, you know, what had happened. And in fairness to her, if she was sitting here, she would say, but you ended it. And I did. I ended the marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Like she started it, but I ended it. Yeah. Right? And I could then fire back and be like, yeah, but you wanted to end it. You just didn't have the guts to do it. And we can go back and forth for eternity. It's like a string back and forth. What the hell is the the point? the blame game. Hey, thanks for being in my life. I loved you. You loved me. I know that. In our own ways, we did. If anyone's tuning in, watching, or listening, like, and and struggling with, like, you know, hitting the wall in a relationship, one of the things, this trickle-down counseling, okay, so I can't can't take the credit for this, but one of my counselors said this. She's like, for 10 years, you guys know three dance moves, and it's worked for 10 years. But if you don't learn some new dance moves, this dance is going to end. And I was like, mm. that is freaking brilliant. And like, like you asked me before, Tony, it's like there were there are parts of us that I think we were hiding from each other, mm-hmm. that we couldn't trust the other person with, for whatever reason. Um, definitely on my end. And at the same time, like, I can also 
admit, yeah, I really love this person. And it was incredibly painful. It was the hardest thing I went through as an adult. Yeah. And I can still be like, I'm so happy for you that you found somebody and that you're moving on. And, and yeah. Yeah, I still have that core wound of the marriage thing that we talked about. Not only that it's the biggest financial decision of your life, right? Because in life and business is that that's your partner. That's who you build with. And what you said exactly is I feel what a lot of people lack is if they've been together for a long time, 20 years, and they only know that version of whoever got into the relationship 20 years ago and they don't evolve with each other and they just continue to grow apart but be like six inches apart in the same bed but they don't feel the emotional connection I think that's the most loneliest feeling that's Mm -hmm. the feeling that I couldn't describe the other day but I think that's what we go on and that's kind of the core wounds that we carry that same insecurity into the next relationship and we should project that into the next person thinking that it's their fault yeah but it's really a core wound I couldn't give that to her Mm -hmm. I look at who I was in that relationship now and I'm like oh yeah I get it and she probably looks at it now too because we're cordial and all that she probably couldn't give that to me and it's never a hundred percent someone's fault unless you're a narcissist Mm. you know because narcissists are never wrong they're a victim and everything they're a victim and everything right i cheated on you but it's your fault yeah (laughs) i wish well i wish we could put them all on an island and just let them sift things out it would be an ex- like interesting games? yeah like an interesting social sell them experiment. to a bunch of rich people yeah but now it sounds like i'm being like you know evil a, a evil yeah and i don't really mean that i know at the core it's because they're hurting and they i'd watch that on hulu i would watch that on hulu yeah, Dude, that's next that. level squid game yeah we'll call that like ho game or something <laughs> <laughs> the Narcy games. Ooh. The games. <laughs> Can we patent that, please? Okay. Can we try to? Yes. This is not human trafficking, right? It's Wasn't not kidnapping there a at all. Book on oh, man, it's just not. It's escaping my mind right now. There's like a. There's an, a lot of narcissistic yeah. books out there with. Um... Anyways, I, I know it was like some childhood book, like a bunch of kids like growing up on an island, and it's like yeah, it's just oh like, yeah, and they have like, to fight for their yeah, life. Yeah. yeah, so it sort of plays out like that, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, it's never a hundred percent one person's fault yeah. or the other. And she had an, she, I'm sure she felt really alone Yeah. as did I. And you have two people who feel really alone and misunderstood and it's just going to work out that way. Yeah. Unless you can learn some new dance moves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there one lesson or philosophy that you've learned to this day and age of all of your journey through your relationships and business of how you want to live your life that you can summarize into like one key i think you just have to learn to love yourself like and accept yourself and love yourself that it sounds so cliche but at the end of the day that's who you have to spend your life with i had a friend they celebrated their kids one year birthday. So we all went out there and we had to write something in a notebook, you know, for her, for his daughter. And I wrote, love yourself. It's who you have to spend the rest of your life with. Mm. And that's really it, right? Like I know a little bit about how you grew up, you know, a little bit now of my, my background and no matter where I travel, how many times I spill my laundry on the on the sidewalk or whatever, whatever hotel room I'm in, whoever I'm with, I'm still with myself. And if you don't like that person and love love them and learn to, you know, especially if you had a tough childhood growing up, like cannot reparent who you were or become the person you wish you had when you were growing up, like it's going to be very tough moving forward and you're going to try to find that in other people and you cannot outsource that it's one of those things that you cannot outsource like in life you cannot outsource working out you have to pick up the weight Mm -hmm. and put it down like there are certain things in life that in this level of existence you just cannot outsource and self-love and self-acceptance is one of those things you can't outsource it. You do. You're going to end up just 
hurting yourself more, mm-hmm. right? So I would say that that's really it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that was really profound. I have some chills going on. <laughs> it's not just cold in here. I'm getting cold. It's not just cold in here. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been we the went. shrooms that I took before. But, uh, <laughs> I'm feeling a little cold. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Um, you can find Mike on Instagram at Mike Kim. And all of his work and all of his dirty laundry will be there, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it's not even him. Maybe it's a social media manager. I don't know. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong camera. <laughs> I do not have a social media manager. Yeah, <laughs> That sounds just, like me. I'm like, oh, I'm up. looking at yeah. the wrong hole. Wrong hole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to put it in the wrong hole. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in and spending some time with us. I hope you got some value from today. Um, I'm Tani. I'm Mike. Stay fit. Stay frugal. Bye. Bye.